No part of this lecture material may be used without the express written consent of Rick Ramos or Contra Costa College. This is Professor Rick Ramos and this is a online course on the legal aspects of evidence. This is part two of lecture one and we're going to be getting right into it talking about the purposes for offering evidence in court. We offer evidence in court for a variety of reasons. The first is as an item of proof to try to show that something happened or to prove that something happened. And hopefully we have enough weight with that proof to convince the jury that in fact someone did something. The next reason that we would provide proof is to impeach or discredit the witness. Various people, during the trial, it's kind of like a, a controlled play. The judge allows people to testify. Uh, people have to get up under cross-examination and tell a story. And there's times when people may be um, incorrect. I can just remember um, the scenes from My Cousin Vinny where in that movie, it was a, a murder case in, in the South, and you had people who got up and basically said they saw something, and piece by piece, the defense attorney, or step by step, the defense attorney was able to go re-interview those people and show that from their perspective, or from the time element, he was able to discredit them all, and he did it in a variety of ways, using pictures to show that the area that they were looking at was blocked, and uh, that they were had an obscured view, or he had one of the eyewitnesses get up in court, and um, he marched back with a tape measure at about 50 feet and held up his fingers and said, how many fingers do I have up? And she couldn't identify how many fingers he had up. So that's, that's examples of proof that you would use to impeach a witness. It could also be used to rehabilitate or support a witness. When you have someone who um, is unable to to recall or a person who is unable to be sure about something they're they themselves they're not sure about what they saw and by providing the evidence you can uh, support or substantiate what they think they might have seen um, one of the other reasons we would use evidence is to assist in determining a sentence evidence might be used to support uh, the fact that during the sentencing process there is an enhancement that might be appropriate to keep a criminal predator locked up for more time. So evidence might be provided to show that that enhancement should be invoked in that instant case. Now, all evidence that's going to be admissible in court has to pass three tests. It has to be relevant, has to be competently presented, and it has to be legally obtained. When we say relevancy, what we mean is that the evidence proves or disproves a fact of consequence to the outcome of the case. That means it's related to the case. If you're talking about a person who beat his wife and we're doing a domestic violence case, but you're talking about how he yelled at the kids that he coaches on his softball team, it may not be relevant. It might not be the same thing. It might be something that's not relevant to the case, so we wouldn't allow that in. It has to be something of consequence, of great import to the case to prove whether or not the defendant actually committed the crime. When we say competently presented, we mean that the witness is properly able to take the stand and testify concerning evidence. That means a person understands that they're under oath and that they must tell the truth, that they're able to competently communicate either if they speak a foreign language that might mean with, that we might have a translator in uh, to talk to to talk for them they can read or write they don't necessarily have to read or write by the way but they may communicate in reading or writing or or what have you but they have to understand the importance of the truth and uh, the importance of what's going to happen as a result of their testimony the third a requirement is that it's legally obtained, meaning that it meets legal standards in the way that it's obtained, that no one's rights were violated. All three tests must be met. And some examples I might give you is the suspect or the defendant is arrested for burglary, and the suspect has three priors for burglary. We would not be able to uh, present that to the court because it's inadmissible, because just because someone uh, stole something three times before doesn't mean that they actually did it on this case and it has the case has got to stand on its own 
unless there's a specific modus operandi that the person has, the MO, their method of operation is so unique that only they're capable of doing it. A second example is police illegally uh, search a car and find a gun. That would also be inadmissible. You know, officers can just do a couple of different uh, changes to the technique for how they stop people. If you have reasonable suspicion to detain somebody and you um, see that the person that you stopped is in a big drug area, you know drug dealers carry guns and other weapons, so you pat him down, and in his pocket you feel what you believe is a hard object, but you're not sure what it is, um, and you can articulate it could be a knife or what have you. You can reach in that pocket and pull it out, but you have to be able to articulate it's a weapon. So you pull it out, and you also pull out a bag of rock cocaine. You got him. That's a good search. Um, officers who basically do things like say, empty your pockets on the hood of my car, oh my gosh, that's a violation of Fourth Amendment. You're going to have to either lie, and now you're violating USC Title 18, Section 241 when you lie in your police report because you're, you're uh, especially if there's a partner there with you, you're conspiring, conspiring to violate rights. That's a federal felony. You're going to go to jail if you get caught on that. So the difference is, is if you have a knowledge of the law and you have a knowledge of how to stop people and a knowledge of how to manipulate the situation legally, and uh, so that you can do the search and also lastly you have to be able to articulate how you did that you have to put all of that in the report so that it's all squared up and the judge is going to agree with you on it another example a five-year-old is sexually molested can they provide competent testimony and a five-year-old could provide competent testimony i actually had a case where a five-year-old saw the neighbor climbing out of a window of another person's house carrying a a snare drum, which was an expensive snare drum. And he was able to testify and articulate that he saw Mr. Jones come out of the window in approximately what time it was. He was a very articulate young kid. And he understood that he needed to tell the truth in this matter. And so a five-year-old could be competent. The next area that we're going to start to discuss is the sources of evidence law. In California, we have the evidence code, and if you go to legalcodes.cal.gov, you can find a lot of this material. I'll try to put a link on the website so that you have access to uh, a, a digital um, library of codes, and you need to start looking at the evidence code. And the evidence code is going to cover the things of import in the courtroom procedure regarding evidence, including witness competency, introduction of writings, privileged communications, and a variety of other things. The penal code is going to talk about things like accomplice testimony, invasion of privacy, and wiretapping. It'll also have in there section 1538, which will discuss motions to um, keep evidence out that might be obtained illegally. U.S. and California constitutions, you know, the California Constitution mimics part of what the U.S. Constitution does. But the things that we have to talk about are the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments, which I've run down to you before, and the right to truth and evidence, Victims' Bill of Rights. And then we also have case law. And case law is made up by judges on the spot. Judges make decisions about what they'll allow in, what they won't allow in, based upon rulings from the Supreme Court and the appellate courts in the United States and in California uh, court system regarding search and seizure and Miranda issues and interpretation of the evidence code statutes. The judges make the interpretation. Rulings made by judges, which become case law, are then reported in a variety of different periodicals that are produced by different companies in California. Another thing of note that I wanted to speak about was the Victim's Bill of Rights and Truth and Evidence uh, Act. In about 1980s, early 80s, the citizens of California passed a, a um, law which basically said that California evidence standards only would run along the same guidelines as the U.S. Supreme Court. Whatever the U.S. Supreme Court or the federal courts had set as the ruling about evidence, California would copy that because California was becoming so liberal, I would say, in the area of 
enforcements of rights that um, it, it became really hard to convict suspects of crimes and the citizens got tired of that saw all these loopholes and closed the loopholes up an example would be that in the early 70s if you stop somebody and you believe they had committed a crime you had to immediately mirandize them that was california law but the federal law basically said that you only have to mirandize somebody when they're in custody when you tell them they're under arrest and that's currently what we use so now I want to move to talking about the different types of evidence that you might collect. And the first thing I want to teach you is an acronym. And I, an acronym is a word that we're going to make up that's going to help us remember other terms. So the acro acronym is F-I-C-E, FICE. And you'll hear, hear me talk about FICE. FICE stands for F, fruits of the crime. Fruits of the crime are the things that you take, the money that you got, the drugs that were stolen, the guns that were stolen the alcohol that was stolen, whatever you got from the crime, that's the fruits of the crime. I, instrumentality. Instrumentality are those things that were used to commit the crime. In a burglary, it could be prying devices like crowbars or screwdrivers, hammers and other sorts of tools, a mask, gloves to hide fingerprints, uh, glass cutting devices, anything like that is instrumentality. In a robbery, it could be the gun, the mask, could be duct tape that is used to tie up the victims. Uh, in, a, in a sex crime, it could be a weapon of any type. It could be latex gloves. It could be devices to tie up the victim. You get the idea. Instrumentality of those things or those tools that are used to commit the crime. C stands for contraband. So that is, contraband could be not related to the crime at all, but the suspect has something on them illegal, illegal, uh, an illegal weapon or a um, drugs or explosives or anything they're not supposed to have. A stolen car could be contraband. E stands for any other evidence. What I mean by that is it's usually evidence that could be transfer evidence. We're going to talk about, I'm just going to really quickly lay on you the, 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 the theory of transfer, and that is that anytime a suspect comes into a scene and leaves, they bring something back away from the scene with them, and they leave something at the scene. And it could be something microscopic, off their shoe, off their clothing, or what have you. And so that other sort of evidence could be hair, it could be fiber, it could be blood, uh, it could be any type of seminal fluid, it could be a fingerprint, it could be a footprint, it could be a variety of other things that we could use to identify that the suspect was there. Other types of evidence would include testimonial evidence, and testimony is given by a witness who has knowledge of facts being tried in the case. And we already talked about we have to show that a witness has to be competent in order to be able to testify. And we'll get more in depth into that in future lectures and chapters here. Next is documentary evidence. And this is writings. And writings are any document or tangible form of communication offered as evidence in court. It can include notes, journals, ledgers, computer-generated uh, photos, emails nowadays, video and audio tapes or video and audio um, MP3s or indicia of occupancy. Indicia of occupancy is items that are used to establish rev residency, including PG&E bills, water bills, garbage bills, tax roll statements, uh, title statements, you know, title forms from the, the county office showing that who's registered at a certain particular place. Having the key to the front door in your pocket would be indicia of occupancy, that sort of, uh, uh, of evidence. Real evidence, again, are material objects. Again, if you think back to the fruits of the crime instrumentality or contraband, it could be any of those things. It's something, basically, something that you can hold in your hand is real evidence. Demonstrative evidence are ob objects that are meant to portray or enhance the meaning of evidence presented to the judge or jury. This could include maps or diagrams, displays, computer simulations, or mock-ups. And we'll talk about those. Uh, all of this is an overview in the first lecture, and we'll get more into depth into all this in future lectures. Physical evidence, which is identifying evidence including trace evidence, which is fiber or, or um, hair, Biological evidence also, which is blood, hair, semen, or saliva. Forensic evidence, which would include fingerprints 
and then we have what's called class identification which if we're looking at class identification and individual individualization the difference between the two are that in class identification we're saying that it is a nine millimeter Smith and Wesson slug that was taken out of the victim and in individualization it is a nine millimeter Smith and Wesson slug that was taken out of the victim which is matched ballistically to the barrel of a Glock 9mm semi-automatic pistol, show number US 1981, registered to Freddie Kelly. And that would be individualization. Relevant evidence. We spoke about this before. It's under 210 of the evidence code, and it's evidence which has any tendency to prove or disprove a disputed fact in the case. This could be used to prove motive or capacity to commit crimes. Um, and that, it, what I mean by capacity to commit crime would mean that, that the person had the actual ability or opportunity to commit a crime. And, and here, let's say that the person has an alibi and they're able to produce a passport and documents that show that they were out of the country during the time that the crime was actually committed. That would be a great piece of evidence to show they didn't have opportunity. Prior threats. Uh, might or might not be considered relevant depending on how old they are and because in in looking at a case that might show motive but it might not mean that the person had that uh, you know the intent concurrent with the act as we spoke about earlier possessing writings or real evidence linked linking a suspect to a crime or physical evidence linking a suspect to a crime scene like footprints fingerprints etc because you got to remember, again, all of those things are um, don't mean the person committed the crime. They means it means the person was in that room at one time. If you have a suspect fingerprints on the counter of a robbery uh, crime scene, it proves that they were there circumstantially. Right? They were there doesn't mean that they committed the crime. Also, could be used uh, to show admission of guilt or a confession or modus operandi and when we talk about admissions and confessions I'm going to close out this lecture by just saying this admissions are a statement that's made by the suspect acknowledging some fact of relevant evidence in the case in the case of a shooting where the suspect admits that he owns a nine millimeter pistol and that was the pistol that was a caliber that was used in the shooting then that could be used against him in court right it would be something against his penal interest because it's relevant. A 9mm was used. You own a 9mm. It's not saying that you did it. It's not even saying that that gun is the gun that did the shooting. And a confession is where the person takes full responsibility for the crime. So in an admission, they basically say something that might be leading toward being able to charge them with the case or might be used against them in court. But... A confession they're actually taking full responsibility for the crime okay so that's it for the part two of lecture one and make sure that you check your homework areas your exam areas and that you're reading each part each web page as it's related to this course so that you're on schedule with the learning process also make sure that you're completing your uh, workbook assignments for this chapter